Ah, hello. I didn't see you there on account of the fact that you broke into my home at three in the morning. But please, make yourself at home. Can I get you anything to drink? Uh, no thank you. Why were you just sitting here doing nothing at 3 a.m.? Ah, uh, but you see, I was doing something. I was playing the hit game Risk of Rain 2. It's good fun. You should try it sometime. In fact, why don't I explain the game to you and you can decide for yourself whether you want to try it out or not. Do I have a choice? No. Then I guess so. Great. You get to live another day. So, I'll start by explaining the basic concept of the game. If you already know the gist of the game, there's no need for you to listen to this. Feel free to skip to this timestamp. What? None of your business. Anyways, to start off, your ship crashed on an alien planet, and you're trying to find a way off. To do so, you must salvage whatever you can from the wreckage of your ship. AKA, you find chests which contain items that will help you throughout the game. Okay. But how do I open these chests? With money, obviously. But how do I make money? Well, there's several ways to make money. One of the simplest is to kill the enemies that spawn throughout your run. Another way is to find these little barrels that contain a small amount of money. Oh, and you can also make a what? A what? Oh, you know. You simply sacrificing my force to the gods for love. But be careful. As the more you use the shrine, the more health it takes away. Of course, this damage can be blocked by items that block incoming damage. Okay, but what am I actually working towards in the game? What's my goal? I literally just told you this one minute ago. Ugh, whatever. Your goal is to make it through each stage, find the teleporter, and beat the teleporter boss. Once you do that around five times, you'll make it to the moon, where you can kill the moon lore, I mean Mithras, Mithras and beat the game. Okay, but what about- Ah, uh, I don't have all day to explain this to you. It's 3am and you're holding me here against my will. I think you've got time. No, I don't. I recommend looking up beginner guides on YouTube if you're new to the game. Can I do that? No. Oh. Anyways, let's move on to what I'll be covering in this video. My personal favorite survivor, Loader. I'm just gonna ignore that video part. Who's that? Hot Muscle Mommy. Oh. Okay. Alright, let's just start off with Loader's base, default abilities. So Mommy- Loader! I mean Loader. Her main ability, Knuckle Boom, is your primary ability. Basically your M1. It's just a simple punch, or I guess more of a swing really, which does 320% damage. That means 320% of your base damage. For instance, Loader at level 1 does 12 base damage, meaning one swing will do around 38 damage without a crit. Alright, seems simple enough, but I'm reading here that she has a passive ability? Yeah, she does. Her passive is called Scrap Barrier. Scrap Barrier makes her immune to fall damage and allows her to gain a temporary barrier upon hitting enemies with either her knuckle boom or either punches. This barrier is the same thing you'd get from the Topaz Bridge item. What's that? Do I look like a wiki? Look it up. But aren't you the one who's supposed to be explaining this to me? Yeah, but I'm not going to go into every little thing. You gotta figure some stuff out on your own. You're just too lazy to do it, aren't you? Moving on, Loader's secondary is her Grapple Fist. Her Grapple Fist is probably what you think it is. It's a grapple that allows for you to swing from wherever you want as long as it's in range. As you can imagine, this allows for high mobility. However, this attack does no damage, and will instead just attach to an enemy the same way it would a wall or a roof, no matter the enemy. But if you really want to damage enemies with your secondary, there's an option for you. The Spiked Fist is the alternative to the Grapple Fist, 
It allows you to deal 320% damage to enemies, employs lighter enemies, such as wisps or beetles, towards you. But, it pulls you towards any heavy targets you hit, like stone golems or greater wisps. It also stuns whichever enemy you hit for a couple seconds. However, you don't have this ability by default. In order to unlock it, you need to complete the Swing By Challenge, which means you need to reach and go through the Celestial Portal in 25 minutes or less. If you want to know what the Celestial Portal is, look it up. Again, I'm not a witch. I'm just some dumbass who sits in a chair at 3am waiting for people to break in so I can inform them about video games. Loader's utility allows her to charge up a punch that can do anywhere from 600 to 2700% damage. Why is there a range to how much damage it can do? Good question. I didn't know you were capable of asking this. The reason for the range of damage is because depending on how charged the punch is, it'll do more damage. Also, the faster you're moving, the more damage you'll do. This punch is usually your main damage dealer, and thus you should make your build around that. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. This punch does have a pretty long charge time, around a second or two I think. But you can hold the charge for, I believe, as long as you want, while still sprinting at full speed. You can even hold it while grappling. Charge Gauntlet also allows you to pierce enemies, which just means you'll go through everything you punch. Oh yeah, did I mention that punching sends you flying? Which makes it great for not only damage, but mobility. Her other utility is Thunder Gauntlet, which allows her to charge up a punch that only hits a single target for 2100% damage. Why isn't there a range there? The reason for that is because the Thunder Gauntlet only punches at full charge, so there's no way to punch before that. Okay. As I was saying, Thunder Gauntlet hits a single target for 2100% damage, but you can also deal more damage the faster you're moving, same as Charge Gauntlet. Now, despite the fact that I said it only hits one target, that doesn't mean it doesn't damage other enemies. After the punch connects, all enemies within a cone behind the enemy you punched will take 1000% damage, but this cone's damage isn't affected by the speed you're traveling at. It will always do 1000% damage. Thunder Gauntlet also charges up significantly faster than Charge Gauntlet, but it doesn't send you as far, and it automatically goes off when fully charged, meaning you can't hold it indefinitely. To unlock the Thunder Gauntlet, you need to do the Earth Shatter Challenge, which is to land a hit with the Charge Gauntlet while moving at at least 300 miles per hour. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah, it is. But don't worry though, it's much simpler than it sounds, and you'll get the hang of it eventually. I believe in you. Anyways, Loader has two special abilities, the first one being her M551 Pylon. This ability throws out a pylon that floats in the air and zaps up to 6 nearby enemies for 100% damage. Pylon is active for around 15 and a half seconds, but the main reason you should be using this pylon isn't for damage, but instead for mobility. Mobility? But you just said it sits still and attacks enemies. I was getting to it, jeez. Loader's pylon is able to be grappled, and I'll need to make a grapple point wherever you want. As you can imagine, this can be very useful. However, it's on a fairly long cooldown of 20 seconds, so unless you have a way to reduce that cooldown, you'll only be able to use this ability sparingly. What's the other one? Can you stop interrupting me for two minutes? God! Yes. Oh, sorry, nothing. Okay then. See you later. Uh, was, was, was that? God? Yeah, we play games from time to time. Cool. Alright, well, finally, Loader's final ability is her Thunder Slam, which makes her slam her fist down and sends you hurling down to the ground dealing 2,000% damage in a 15 meter radius upon impact. It also stuns enemies. In order to unlock this ability, you need to complete the challenge of the Thunder Dome, which requires you to kill three other loaders in the Bulwark's Ambery. I assume you're not going to tell me about this Bulwark's Ambery, then? Nope. Thought so.
All right, let's take a break from all the numbers and the strategy and get into some more fun stuff before we get back to the numbers and strategy. But for now, let's talk about some loader lore. I really don't care about lore. We're talking about lore and that's final. Do you understand? Y yes Good. Now, all the lore I'm about to say is 100% real and true and canonical. All of it. And you can't argue otherwise. Okay? Okay. So, Loader worked as a cargo loader. She would use the exoskeleton she wears during the game to transport cargo to and from the spaceships she worked on. One day, someone, who I can only assume to be the survivor captain, approaches her and asks her to embark on the mission to Petrichor 5. The planet that both Risk of Rain 1 and 2 takes place on. But the ship crashes once it reaches Petrichor 5. What? Most of the survivors you play as in the game escape the crash using escape pods. Loader is one of those survivors. She lands on the planet and she uses the exoskeleton she equipped with custom grappling hooks to either escape from the planet, heart still racing, or vanish, never to be seen again, halting her momentum forever. Or she just dies like this. Okay, now that the in-game lore is over, we can focus on the 100% factual and true lore from outside the game. Now, we can all agree that Loader is 100% gay or bi. I believe Armin it's totally 100% factual that Loader is definitely dating Artificer. I mean, come on. That just sounds like your headcanon. Shut up! It's totally 100% true! Uh-huh. Whatever. You can never understand the sheer depth of this 100% true and factual lore. Also, Loader's definitely trans. I mean, the Loader from Risk of Rain 1 was a guy, and the Loader from Risk of Rain 2 is a woman. There's simply no other way. Okay, you mentioned something about items earlier. What exactly are those? Well, there's a myriad of items in this game. Specifically, 186 items, including equipment. That's a lot of items. Yeah, but you'll eventually learn what they all do over time. For now though, I'll tell you what items you should use as a loader. What do I need to use? I was getting to it! Stop interrupting me, you bitch! <clears throat> Sorry about that, but please. I was getting to that. So I'll start off with white items. Ideally, you'll want to get items like the backup mag, crowbar, focus crystal, and any type of item that increases your movement speed, like the energy drink or goat hoof. What do those items do? Like I said, I'm not a wiki, but I will give you a quick overview of each item since it's necessary to understand what I'm saying. So the backup mag gives you an extra use of your secondary. In this case, it gives you an extra charge of your grapple. The crowbar makes it so you do much more damage if the enemy you're hitting is above 90% health. The focus crystal allows you to do more damage to enemies that are close to you, specifically within 13 meters of you. And the other two items simply increase your movement speed, allowing you to move faster and therefore do more damage. Because, if you remember, your punches do more damage the faster you're moving. Okay, but you called them white items, so are there other item rarities? Obviously. Did you think there was only one rarity? Why the hell would I mention the rarity of the items if there wasn't more than one rarity? Okay, geez, sorry. Yeah, you better be. Anyways, on to green items. Some good green items to have are the ukulele, as this item gives you a chance to fire a chain of lightning, being multiple enemies with one attack. The next green item is actually two items, but they're both very good together. These are the bands, Runods and Kijaros, or Kiaros, I don't fucking know. These items are good on pretty much every survivor, so it's good to pick them up if you see them. On a hit that does more than 400% damage, the Runald's Band will slow enemies and deal damage, but it's on a cooldown of 10 seconds. And the Kajaro's Band spawns a fire tornado on attacks that do more than 400% damage, and this also has a cooldown of 10 seconds. 
but the reason I grouped these items together is because they actually share a cooldown, and if you have them both, they'll proc at the same time. And lastly, the Wax Quill is a good item to use, as it allows you to gain a boost to speed simply by jumping while you're sprinting, which is obviously good for your punches. I'm looking at some screenshots of the game. I told you not to do that. Yeah, yeah, but what's that big square next to all the abilities? Oh, I was just about to go over that. That's where your equipment goes. What equipment you use can have a very substantial role in how you play. As such, the equipment I would recommend getting is the Spinal Tonic. Spinal Tonic is just an overall good equipment to have on most survivors. Upon activating, the Tonic increases your damage by 100%, attack speed by 70%, armor by 20%, maximum health by 50%, passive regen by 300%, and movement speed by 30%. Obviously, you can tell why this is a good item. However, it comes up with a downside. Every time the Tonic wears off, there's a 20% chance for you to gain a Tonic Affliction, which reduces all your stats by 5%, and this can stack. There is a way to make the Tonic even better and outright remove its downside, but I'll talk about that later. Why not talk about it now? Because it's my video, and I will do as I like. Video? Nothing. Ignore that. Okay. As I was saying, the next set of items I'll talk about are the red items. These items are particularly rare. They have about a 1% chance to drop from small chests, but there are better ways to get them, but I won't go over those here. If you really want to know, then look it up. I'm not Google. For someone giving me an overview of a game, you sure are telling me to look a lot of stuff up. Yeah, because... you know what, whatever. I don't care. Sorry? Don't be. Anyways, most rare items are good, but the one I would highly recommend getting is the Hard Light Afterburner. This item adds two more charges to your utility skill, aka your punches, and reduces its cooldown by 33%. As I have said many times, your punches are your main source of damage as loader. So having more of them on a lower cooldown allows you to output much more damage. Lastly, I'll go over Void items. What are those? They're items that were included with the DLC. Is that it? I. Am. Not. A. Wiki. Yeah, yeah, I know. There are three Void items I recommend going for. Those are the Lysate Cell, which gives you an extra charge of your special skill, aka your Pylon or Slam. The Poly Loot, as this item has amazing single target damage. And finally, the Weeping Fungus, or Wungus as many call it. This item heals you as long as you are sprinting, so it's pretty good for a survivor who's pretty much always sprinting. You said those were the final items you were going for, but what about Lunar and Boss items? Oh yeah. I have nothing to say for Boss items, but I do have something to say for Lunar items. The main lunar item I recommend grabbing is the Gesture of the Drowned, as it reduces the cooldown for your equipment significantly. However, it makes it so whenever your equipment comes off cooldown, it's automatically used immediately. This pairs greatly with the Spinal Tonic, as with enough gestures, you can have 100% uptime on your tonic, and you won't ever have to worry about tonic affliction. Wow, that sounds extremely broken. It is. Finally, I'd like to go over some general tips and strategies that you can use as a loader. So, on the moon, before the final boss fight, you must charge up four pillars if you want to make it up to the arena. But, you are able to skip these pillars, and it's easiest to do as a loader. In fact, you can do it without any items, as long as you're using your cooldowns effectively. So I was reading the wiki and it says that with the spike gauntlet you can damage enemies without it going on cooldown? Yeah, there's a certain distance where the spike gauntlet hits and does damage but doesn't go on cooldown. Do you know what this distance is? Nope. Oh. Okay. It's a fairly niche tech anyway, so it's not too important to know. Then why did you include it in the script? Moving on? A good way to build up speed for your punch, assuming you're not using the spike gauntlet, is to attach to an airborne enemy and swing around them until you're at high speed, then just punch towards whatever you're trying to hit. 
This is especially useful during teleporter events where there's lots of enemies around and there will most likely be at least one flying enemy. This is a little less useful with the Spike Gauntlet equipped, since the only heavy flying enemies are the Greater Wisp and Lunar Chimera Wisp, but you can still attach to bosses and do the same thing. However, this is less effective on some bosses like the Imp Overlord or Magma Worm. Are you not gonna ask what those bosses are? You're not a wiki. Good job. The next tip I have for you before I call the cops. You what? Oh, nothing, nothing. As I was saying, the next tip I have for you is to never be scared to get the fuck out of there. Loader has the highest mobility out of all the survivors, so don't be afraid to use it. If you're in a teleporter event and there's just too many enemies for you to handle, then get the hell out of there and heal a bit and figure out what you're gonna do. Or, if you're just barely alive, surrounded by enemies, use a grapple in combination with a punch to fly away and find a safe spot to heal. So, did I hear you say something about cops? No, I think you're hearing things. Anyways, the final, most important tip I have for you before you're dragged out of here by the police is that Loader is hot. Anyways, Thanks for letting me talk about this game with you. I hope you learned something. Oh, yeah. I think I did. That's good. Anyhow, bye. Wait, what? I thought you said there weren't cops. I lied. You broke into my house at 3 a.m. and were obviously trying to rob me. Look, man. We we can we can figure something out. Uh, I swear, bro. I, I, I... Please! We just killed your dog for no reason! I see that. Anyways, we're gonna take him! You cool with that? Yeah, do whatever. Cool! Thanks! That's not even my dog. They brought a random dog just to shoot it. Whatever. I'm gonna go to bed. I'm sure no one will break in while the window's already broken. Hey, hey, wait, don't go yet. Hold on, let me just... Okay, cool. So, first of all, I'd like to thank you for making it to the end of this video. This video has basically been my life for the past, like, two months, and I sure fucking hope it looks like it. But I'd really appreciate it if you liked and subscribed, and maybe commented. If you're feeling extra saucy, wink. I wrote wink into the fuck- how the- how am I gonna show a wink? Whatever. I'd also like to thank my friend Nicholas for being the other person I'm talking to in this video and for being the police officer that you just heard shoot my dog. I'd also like to thank my friend Nate for giving me a lot of feedback on this video and just generally making it look better. Alright, this video is long enough. If I have anything else to say, I'll write it on the screen now. I'll definitely be making more of these how to play properly videos, so keep an eye out.